Hey, welcome. Hello and welcome to another live stream. Glad you're here. I'm Dan, your friendly fishmonger. We do this every Wednesday at 9 Eastern time. Well, if you're me, it's Southern Mountain time. But for those that don't know where the mountains are, 9 Eastern time every Wednesday, where we talk about fish and we, uh, yeah, basically geek out about fish. That is what we are here to do. So we are going to start as we do every week with a shipping report tell you how everything went um, I'm delighted to report that there has not been any issues since I talked to you last um, let me just double check in my mind here yeah I think that's a correct statement so things are going well um, things are actually starting to arrive a little warm in the low 80s instead of in the mid 70s upper 70s so <clears throat> this shipment that I just sent out today I cut down heat packs, heat packs a bit. So where I would normally have sent two heat packs, I sent one. Um, or if I would have normally sent some larger heat packs, I, I sent smaller ones. There's a couple exceptions to that. There are a few um, places that are still kind of cold, and so I, you know, packed for that. But in general, we're starting to taper off on the heat packs a little bit, and hopefully within a few more weeks we won't need them at all. That that will be awesome. Candy Overhaul is letting me know that the audio is good. Thanks, Candy. I appreciate that. <laughs> it's nice to hear that every live stream, so I don't have to <laughs> wonder. Um, there's nothing worse than when the audio goes bad in the live stream and you're live. Oh, Like poor Simply Betta. She did a live stream Sunday, I think it was. Uh, Taylor was live to celebrate uh, 100,000 subs. That's pretty awesome. Congratulations, Simply Betta. And... Uh, <laughs> The mic went out on her. Like, I hate it when that happens. So, I felt her pain, for sure. Swamp Thing, 97 degrees in South Florida today. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. It's getting hot. So, I did ship to Florida, a few boxes to Florida today. And I did have to put in a small heat pack, but I, I put in a very small one, just so that it would keep the fish warm overnight while it's going to Billings and Louisville, because it's going to be down in the 40s at those two locations. Um... And when it hits Florida tomorrow morning, that heat pack will be mostly mostly used up. There'll be a little bit of heat still, but hopefully it'll get to that person before, you know, before it gets to be 97 degrees out. Yeah, it's a little tricky when you're shipping to Florida or southern Texas or Arizona or, you know, places that are really hot. But it, it works pretty well, though. You just use a smaller heat pack, get them uh, <clears throat> through the night when it's cool so that by the time they get to that location the heat packs kind of burned out so the fish didn't get too cold and on the delivery end they don't get too hot and so far we're, we're doing fine with that I still dream though of the day when perhaps someone invents uh, some kind of little thermostatically controlled miniature tiny little shipping device that can keep boxes at a steady temperature so we can say, hey, we want this to be 75 degrees in this box, and it has a little thermostat and a little heater, and it, it knows what to do. Like, that would be awesome, taking the guesswork out. But for now, we've got heat packs, and it's a bit of an art and a science, <laughs> but so far, so good. Um, all right, it's here. So that's the shipping report. Everything's good. Now, last week, I put out a call asking for feedback on anyone who had received any of the Congo spotted puffers from me um, over the last several months. Uh, Tetrodon Shodeni is, is that puffer. And I'm happy to report that everyone that reached out to me said that theirs is doing fine. So there was a customer that got one and, and over time it, just gra it didn't do well and it gradually wasted away. Um, and I was concerned that it, I wanted to find out if that was a general condition, like is that something that's happening to lots of people or was that an isolated incident? And so far from the feedback I've received, um, it sounds like it was just an isolated incident. So that makes me feel good on one hand because it's like, okay, good. I, it's, it's not something I have to change my whole protocol for or just decide, <clears throat> just decide that, excuse me, they're like, hey, nobody's been successful with these. I can't bring them in anymore, right? It seems like it's something that can continue and do well. On the other hand, though, I do feel sorry for the client that 
that their fish didn't do well. And it wasn't immediate or anything. It was this, this long, gradual thing. And so I, I'm real sorry about that. You know who you are. And just I'm sorry that happened. And I'm going to work with you to, to make sure that we can get you another shot at that species uh, to be successful. So um, that's I just wanted to close the loop on that. Um, before we get to the giveaway, I want to talk about something exciting that's happening here at Dance Fish. Uh, we have, you guys might know, not know yet, I've mentioned his name a couple times, but we hired a gentleman named Chris. Um, and Chris is heading up our, our media production, basically. He's creating a lot of videos. You'll have noticed a lot more content appearing in the Dance Fish Facebook page and on Instagram and things, that's all Chris. He's he's helping take the reins on that and we're working with him to get some more stuff churned out. Um, so I can continue doing what I do. <laughs> and so it's it's been great to have him come on board. And he's got this uh, this plan, this, this, this project that he's starting, which is he's creating a documentary about Dan's fish. So we're about to go into a big expansion. We're about to build a warehouse. Um, the city did approve the subdivision finally. So that's been done. Um, now, now the subdivision is approved. They can approve the permit to construct. So everything's moving along again. That, that roadblock that we ran into, which was waiting for the subdivision to be completed and approved by the city. Um, has been cleared so things back on track so um it's going to be i think a really interesting to f thing to follow all the well all the the progress we make and all, all the hurdles we run into that we have to figure out how to overcome to make this project work and so chris has started he dropped a trailer on the channel today about what we're going to be doing the first episode of this new series, I think he's calling it Building Dan's Fish, will drop on this Sunday at 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And that's kind of an introduction to Dan's Fish and what we do and who we are, what we do and how we do it, basically. So a lot of you here probably will know most of that stuff, but for someone that's coming in brand new, and, and that's the first video they see, we want them to just get a sense of who we are, what we do, and how we do it. So. It's kind of an introduction to the series, I guess you would say. And then um, we're going to release a video pretty regularly. Well, not pretty regularly, really regularly. Right now it's going to be every two weeks on every other Sunday um, where Chris basically follows us around with a camera all day and then cuts out the interesting bits and, and makes a documentary type type video from that. So we're going to launch that and try that and hopefully people will like it. I think it'll be interesting to document the journey with you guys. I mean, I'm going through the journey anyway, so might as well have a camera there so we can share it with you. So um, cheers, Chris. And it's a ton of work. So <laughs> cheers and good luck. <laughs> um, but it's been great to have some help. Um, Chris has been quietly behind the scenes for the last several weeks, helping getting us up to par. Um, he's about to get some merch stuff launched. We figured out the design. We found a company that does, um, like one thing we didn't want is we find lots of companies that'll do merch, but it's it seems like it's really cheap. Like it's basically a sticker that they laser print and, and paste onto the cap, something like, like if it's a hat, right? We didn't want that. We want something that will last. So we, we found a company that will do uh, embroidery. Like if you buy a hat, it'll be embroidered. Um, and I'm going to test that, um, bring in a couple of shirts and things from them and make sure that it's really as good as it looks, right? And if it is, then we'll go with that company and, and finally get some, some merch out. I know people have been asking for some is the is the new logo is being produced and, and all that. And so we're, Chris is working on that. And, and we are working on that, just so you know. Um, the last thing before we get the, to the giveaway is I want to do a correction that I did not know. So when I released the video about the new fish that had come from Nigeria, um, one of the fish that we talked about was the African knife fish. 
And in the video I said it's gonna need live and frozen foods because as far as I knew that was true, but they have started eating Viber bites and sinking carnivore pellets as well. So they're a little easier to feed than I anticipated. Um, I had never seen them do that before, but they started a few days ago um, and they eat them just fine, like just as readily as live food or frozen foods. So uh, if you have African knife fish or if you end up getting one, uh, you don't have to have just frozen and live. You can mix in some Viber bites and, and carnivore pellets and other meaty foods that sink to the bottom. They seem to do well with. I wouldn't do flake foods. I think that would create quite a mess. But anything that's kind of like a compact ball, PE mysis pellets, things like that would be just fine, I think. Okay, now for the giveaway, we're going to be giving away some cardinal tetras. And if you've tried cardinal tetras in the past and not had luck, I would encourage you to try one more time. This is a really good source. The cardinal tetras are pretty rock solid. And we have lots of customers who have not been able to do well with cardinal tetras. And then they try ours and they do fine. And it's just a sourcing issue. Some of the sources you get, they come in and they just don't do well. Like they just gradually kind of one at a time, two at a time, die off over a period of several weeks. Um, I don't know what it is that they have. I've never been able to diagnose it or figure it out. But we have found a source that comes in really clean and they do really well. So if you like Cardinal Tetras and you've tried and you just have no luck, um, I think this strain might be helpful. So for those that don't know what we're talking about, and I assume that everyone does, but if you don't, they're an old favorite. These guys, um, they get a they get bigger than a neon tetra, and they have a longer, slimmer body shape, and the red on them goes all the way across the body. The main difference between them and a neon tetra, as far as just telling from from your eye, is this one right here. This is a neon tetra. The red is only on the back half of the body. Whereas this one right here, this is a cardinal tetra. The red goes across the entire fish. So that's how you can tell the difference even though they're, they're very similar. And if you'd like to win some cardinal tetras, just hashtag cardinal. You couldn't have guessed it. <laughs> hashtag cardinal in the chat will get you entered to win some of those. If you would like, I'll send you a minimum of three, maximum of six. And I plan to send those out um, on Monday of this coming week for arrival to you on Tuesday. Uh, UPS next day air shipping. And there's no charge. You don't have to pay for shipping. You don't have to pay anything. All you have to do is enter by... Um, typing hashtag cardinal in the chat and that's it later on we will do a drawing and you might win some okay I think that's about all I had I am expecting um, a new order to a new import to come in from Ni uh, not Nigeria from Indonesia it was supposed to come this week I guess yeah but it got delayed, so I'm, I, we're, we're thinking for next week. We're in that limbo stage where we're waiting for <clears throat> for confirmation that the shipping agent from that the exporter uses was able to solidify a flight and get the airway bill and everything. So they plan on next week, but until I actually get the airway bill, then it's still kind of up in the air. And even sometimes when you get the airway bill, a flight can be canceled or something. So we're in that stage of... Uh, it's coming. We think it's next week, <laughs> but we also thought it was this week, so we'll see. But there, there are a lot of species on there I'm very excited about. One is um, a puffer. The, the red belly puffer is the common name. The scientific name is Iribesco. All right, so what is it? It's a Carino Tetraodin Irubesco. Okay, let's put that in here and show you guys. These are a miniature little puffer that I've been trying to get for a long, long, long time. Um, they stay small. They don't get bigger than, I don't know, maybe an inch and a half or so, if you can believe seriously fish. 
and they're just a cute little puffer. Now they are not like Amazon puffers or Congo puffers in that they are community oriented. It's it's not <laughs> it's not the case, but um, but they are a neat little miniature puffer. So if you like pea puffers, but you want something a little bigger, a little different. They're a pretty cool, a uh, good option for that. Um, so just wait in on that. That is coming along with a, a bunch of other cool stuff. We'll restock some of the location specific uh, rainbow fish and um, some of the super blue carry tetras again and some of the more exotic silver dollars like the red hooks and the blueberries and the black bard, things like that. Um, there's a lot of cool stuff on the order. I don't want to get into it too deep. I already broke my rule. <laughs> because when I tell people what, what I ordered before it arrives, um, and then it doesn't arrive because it got shorted or something, then I just create disappointment. So I shouldn't have gone that far into it. But um, I will... Uh, I'll refrain. I'll tell you later when the, when the order arrives. But I, I do expect that to happen. All right. So with that, we're going to get to your questions and comments. I did see someone ask earlier, it floated by as, as I was um, talking about the shipment report, asking if the Nigerian import ever arrived. It did. It already arrived and it's listed for sale. Um, and it's been, it's why I'm real tired today. It's been uh, for sale for I think we listed it Friday of last week and things are going like hotcakes. So I've done nothing but like prep and pack fish since Sunday. <laughs> so I'm pretty tired. It's been a long day, but it's worth it. It's awesome. Um, I can't wait to get in the warehouse though with the team to help. It's, it's time to get out of this basement. Like there's no windows. I've been down here for a couple years now, a couple, two and a half years. Yeah, it's time to get out of the basement <laughs> before I go stir crazy. Swamp Thing, the wife thought the teaser was awesome. She is on board. Awesome. Glad to hear it. In fact, some people have reached out and emailed or texted or whatever and said how much they liked it. So I'll pass that on to Chris. Uh, I think he did a good job with it. By the way, all that footage in the teaser, that's all our local area. Um, that's my backyard, all those those mountains with all those rivers and beautiful views and stuff that was taken right here uh, right in our backyard so it's a cool place to live what sleeves aquatics I have a five gallon Skittles mix tank I guess we're talking about by Skittles mix tank we talking about shrimp some platinum rice fish eggs snuck in on some floaters I was given and two hatched. They're growing fine. Will they be okay in their long term? Yeah, I think platinum rice fish, it's a Madaka species, right? Um, we'll do fine. If you're asking if they can go with uh, Caridina or Neo Caridina shrimp, sure, no problem. They'll eat some babies. Um, they might eat some adults in molt, but in general, if it's well decorated or well planted or whatever, um, I think you'll be okay. Kids Aquatics like the intro vid as well. Cool. Thanks, Bob. And, and this reminds me, I need to thank my mods. Thank you so much for being here. I appreciate you all. And uh, Candy, I hope the move is going well. I heard a rumor that you're, uh, you're skedaddling out of the, the true west <laughs> and going further west. So... Um, if that if that's indeed the case, then I wish you luck. I hope it's going well, and I'll miss having you as a neighbor. But but I get why. It it's not quite. I I know candy doesn't like really harsh winters, so it's not quite paradise, but it's a step in the right direction if you don't like winters. Um, speaking of harsh winters. If you want to move to Wyoming, so we, we found our marketing person, Chris, is working on all that stuff. We are still looking for someone, though, to help operate the warehouse. So this would be someone who's in charge of taking care of the fish, managing the team that cares for the fish, make sure that the fish are all healthy and up to standard and doing well before they're shipped, and then make sure that the shipping procedures are followed and all the customers receive you know quality happy fish so if you like working with fish and you're here so i assume you do um we are looking for that person so send me an email dan at dancefish.com with a cover letter and a resume 
And don't worry if you you are like, man, I don't have a long resume or whatever. That's fine. Just, you know, put something together um, and send it over. And what I'm trying to say is, I think some people sometimes are like, man, my, my CV or my resume is not impressive enough. But if you're a young whippersnapper and you like this kind of stuff and you want a shot, I'm just saying don't be discouraged if you don't have like, well, I haven't had 20 jobs and all that. You know, I've, I'm, I just got out of college or high school or whatever. Um, it's all right. Just send it over. But I need a cover letter and resume. So um, even if you don't have anything, you'll figure something out, right? <laughs> all right. <laughs> um, West Sleeve Aquatics. Uh, okay, I already got that one. The Chubby Guppy throwing down nine ninety nine. Thanks, Chubby Guppy. Right back at you. I appreciate it. Thanks for the super chat. Always appreciated. Never required, but it does make my wife super happy when money falls out of the computer. Kelly Foreman, I think Chris is doing a smashing job. Thanks, Kelly. I think he's doing a good job, too. And I'm so glad to have him on board. It's so nice to have the help. Fishaholic, howdy. Take that gin tonic break, bud, and hello to the fish family from Sean. Well, hello back at you. I'll take the I'll take the break. Ah, tap water. Tink. <laughs> There's a tap water commercial. Fish fan 2, where I'm from, Cardinal Tetras are called Neon Tetras. Oh, that's interesting. What do they call Neon Tetras? Cardinal Tetras? Just curious. Raphael Swit, the trailer had a hidden Easter egg of what to expect in future giveaways. <laughs> <laughs> B Taurus. Okay, I don't know what a B Taurus is. And I I might totally regret this, but I'm gonna look it up right now. But I'm gonna do it privately before Okay, I'm looking at a big bowl. <laughs> big bull cow. Fishaholic just picked my name this time. We'll see, we'll see. Gold Nugget Pleco Tetra, absolutely love Cardinal Tetras. What's not to love? They are one of the most beautiful fish ever. Like, that includes marine fish and saltwater fish. Just period. They're awesome. They're peaceful. They're great. I love them too. It's hard to beat. Like, I've been in... Every now and then, it doesn't happen often, but every now and then, I will walk into a pet store and they'll do it right. They'll have like a large tank. Maybe it's 280 gallon tanks, uh, 280 gallon tank. And it's just like a quarter of it is just full of neon tetras. And they're in this big group going around the tank and it just looks fantastic. Um, I've seen it a few times where big old tank, big group of cardinal tetras. And that is just so impressive every time I see it. Fishaholic, I want some of those gold denison barbs anytime soon. Um, I ordered them and... Okay, let me look real quick. I don't think they had any this time. I bought them out the last few times. And I think that they needed... Okay, let me look here. I'm looking on the Proforma invoice. Yeah. Nope they're out so I tried I try every time but they're very limited supply and I basically bought them out the last couple orders so it takes a while to raise a new batch up to size and stuff um, they usually don't ship them out unless they're about two inches and so it's a few months to get fish bred and raised up to that size so I'm trying Right. Candy Overholes is reminding folks to type at Dance Fish so that I can see. Yep, if you do that, it'll turn bright orange for me right here. That at Dance Fish uh, selection. And so it makes it really easy for me to see your questions and comments. If it doesn't do that, if you don't do that, then it just blends in with the rest of the chat. And I don't know it's directed at me. Um, and I don't read all the chat that isn't highlighted just because. There's a lot of talking among yourselves, right? You and your buddies are here just having a side conversation, which is great. Um, but it means I've got to look for the stuff directed at me. It's kind of how we manage things 
here. Okay, hang on. Okay. Fish Guy Mikey, I have two rainbows and they have Cloudy Eye and a little bit of fungus. Should I treat with Metroplex and or Canaplex? Um, cloudy Eye and Fungus. Is, is it like all in the eye or are they doing that normal thing rainbows do where they get a little, little white on the lips? Um, the stuff on the lips usually goes away within a few weeks if you just keep the water nice and clean. Often rainbows will do that shortly after shipping or shortly after settling into a new tank because it takes them a little while to learn not to rub against the glass so much or uh, during shipping not to rub against the bag so much, right? So they're putting all that pressure on their lip and it's not uncommon for them to develop a little white on their lip while they're settling in and learning the new environment. Usually once they do, it's usually never a major thing. Um, and once they kind of settle in, it goes away. And if the water's kept clean, it goes away pretty, pretty quickly and, and stays away. So when you say the fungus, what I'm imagining is you're talking about that little mouth thing, which is very normal. Cloudy eye, I don't know. It depends on how bad it is. Um, sometimes I'll have fish that develop a cloudy eye. And it's again, I just keep them in really clean water. And usually it goes away on its own. But there's degrees of cloudy eye, right? If it's like super bad or it's swollen or it's, um, yeah, I mean, depending on how it's presenting, it might be worth putting it in a quarantine tank and, and trying to treat it with salt and some, some medication. But it's a, it's a, there's pros and cons though, because putting a fish in a quarantine tank is itself a stressful experience to the fish, right? It's going into a completely new habitat. It's going into a different tank. It's moving again, right? And usually our quarantine tanks are fairly bare and um, not as inviting as our normal aquariums, which might be planted or have lots of decorations and be uh, more long-term systems. So quarantine tanks can be stressful in the fish. So the, it's kind of this guessing game or this, not this guessing game, but this decision that we have to make between is it going to be less stressful on the fish if I just keep it in its tank and make sure the water is kept really clean and the fish has a good diet and keep the stress level down and the fish will gradu gradually recover on itself or is this bad enough that it really needs to go in a quarantine tank and or a hospital tank I should say and get some major medicine in it so each case is different sometimes it's better just to leave the, the fish where it is and let it relax and settle in and, and heal on its own. Mega Mindy Lou, I see pencil fish on your get gills. How are they compared to the head standards? Would they get along with them? So I think that the African pencil fish, I think are the ones you're talking about. These are really cool. So I want to show people this fish. Um, <clears throat> just one moment. So I think we're talking about these narrow Cherex. Latifasciatus, it's a fish I've been trying to get in for literally years, and I've ordered them in the past, and they always send me something else. This time I finally got it. Um, I think that these, they're, they're, they're more of a lower level fish. They stay in the bottom third of the aquarium. They always point down, and they kind of go down a lot like a headstander and pick at stuff on the bottom of the tank. That's how they feed. So I would say that they're kind of the analog to a head standard that has been developed, uh, adapted, created in Africa that, um, versus the head standards in South America, right? Um, and I don't think I'd put both in the same tank. They, they've adapted and become what they are by being in the same type of niche. So I think that they would um, kind of compete for the same niche. So I wouldn't put them together. But in a tank where I wanted a head stander, they might be a viable option. They're really cool though. I like them a lot. Okay. 
Alicia and AS, were you able to ID the rest of the fish from Nigeria? No. Um, in fact, I need to follow up on that. And it's my fault. I put out some... Uh, I put it out for identification, and I checked a couple times to see if I've got a good ID back, but I haven't checked in a few days, so I need to I need to follow up on that. I just got too busy shipping the fish. Um, I also need to get some good pictures and send them to the exporter and ask him if they can ID them for me, and I just haven't had two seconds to do that. But I'm not shipping tomorrow or Friday, and so I have a couple days uh, starting tomorrow where I think I can move on that some more. I got some suggestions from some people on what the ID might be, but so far I haven't found one that I think actually is correct. So I'm still looking for that. For those that don't know, I got, um, I ordered some of the, the African banded bar, barbs or eight banded barbs they might be called, um, which is, well, let me just show you, it's easier. These little guys, this is what I ordered, and I've been trying to get these for quite a while, actually. But what I was sent was something completely different, and it's actually two different species, and so I'm trying to get an ID on them. So if you know your African cyprinids really well, shoot me an email, dan at dancefish.com, and I'll send you a picture. Maybe you can help me identify them. Brian Maramba, hey, moving to Montana from Alaska. Any pro tips for moving tanks and fish? Um, yeah, my, the way I, oh, I'm still showing, there, <laughs> I'm back. The way I would suggest you do that is treat them as if you're shipping them, especially a long move like that. So I would actually pack them up as if I was shipping them, uh, put them in insulated boxes, heat packs, whatever you got to do, um, and ship them to myself. But, you know, instead of sending them through a carrier, I just put them in my truck <laughs> up front. Where it's warm right but that's how i would do it i wouldn't try to like move them in the tanks or or do some kind of temporary thing i'd actually pack them up like i was shipping them but that's just me that might not be the best way for you or anything but as a guy that ships fish a lot that's my natural my natural go-to fade wood it's been a while yes welcome good to see you kenny overalls i am dan may 19th i moved to the greater seattle area awesome awesome good for you closer to work and i hope i hope you love it and i hope caleb loves it and stacy and everything and we'll miss you lady montana is never going to be the same again but that's that's okay we've got we've got brian moving to montana so candy leaves brian comes in to fill her shoes <laughs> as if anyone could do that ken's fish how do you treat for pheromones Kent, I, I don't know what you meant by that. Um, maybe you got autocorrected, but pheromones are just chemicals that are released by organisms for scent, right? Usually to attract a mate or mark a territory or something. So I don't think you'd want to treat for pheromones. I'm guessing you meant to type something else. So correct me if I'm wrong. Mega Mindy Lou, if you want to have an annex warehouse in San Antonio, I'm your girl. <laughs> San Antonio, that's that's down where by where my brother is. Orange Cones, can the cover letter have Rapashi on it? <laughs> I'd be disappointed if it didn't. <laughs> Some like frozen brine shrimp that was spilled on it and kind of dried and stuck to it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Globe Gaming, any tips for green phantom plecos? Not really. Um, I'm not a pleco expert. I'm getting more into them. The green phantom is not one I've kept long term ever. So I'm probably not the best person to talk about that. But I know a lot of people in, ch in chat have kept that fish. It's a, it's a favorite for a lot of people. So would you guys chime into Globe Gaming? Um, any special tips on green phantom plecos? Um, they're a, a hype and sister species, so you want to feed them meaty stuff. They aren't going to survive just like on algae, like an ancestress. 
well, Ancestress won't either, but it, they're more of a carnivore than your typical Ancestress. Um, and plecos need places to hide to feel secure and all that. They like clean water. They come from areas, at least that species, of really fast-flowing water. So they don't do well in really dirty, grimy water. Although they're tough, but it's not something they're used to. So um, you know, that's, that's kind of my general thoughts. But someone who's kept them long-term can probably give you something better than that. Oops, chat jumped on me. Just a moment here. Wow, it really jumped. Holy cow. Just a moment. Woo, it's going to take me a while. It went like all the way down when it jumped. Oh, there it is. Nathaniel. Yep. Nathaniel Blakely, what's the hottest you will ship fish at? I ship year-round. If they're hot, I just put in a cold pack. So if it's real cold, I put in heat packs. If it's real hot, I put in cold packs. But we ship year-round. The only time that I don't ship is if I know that there is a weather problem that will delay them. Like, well, if my local airport is in blizzard conditions and no flights are going out, that's one thing. Um, if there's a problem, like a big ice storm in Memphis, um, or not Memphis, because uh, I'm using UPS, so it's uh, uh, Louisville, then then I'll like not ship. But it almost never happens. Um, it's usually maybe once or twice a year that we run into weather where it's like, ooh, we better not ship this week. But besides that, we ship all year round, every week, um, except for the two weeks around Christmas. Things are just too way backed up in the for the carriers, UPS and FedEx and USPS, to count on there not being delays in those instances. So we ship year round, and I think we average one big delay a year, maybe as high as two, where like one time uh, the processing warehouse had a mechanical failure, like a big conveyor belt broke down or something. And so packages were delayed a day just because UPS literally couldn't process packages. Um, there was, we've had one delay this year. What was it? It was weather related. I can't remember the specific, oh yeah, it was that big cold snap that went down through Texas and, and all that. And it basically cut it drained the power grid so again the shipping warehouses like couldn't keep up right their, their power was out or something like that I can't remember exactly what it was but I think that's what it was that time uh, in 2020 we had something where was it severe flooding in one of the big shipping hubs anyway it, it tends to average that there's only once a year that we have like a big thing where it's like, well, I guess all the boxes are delayed. And I think in 2020, we had a total, besides that, where there was like one day where like everything we sent was delayed a day. Um, I think there were less than 10, if I remember correctly, other packages that didn't arrive the day they should have, that were reported. So in general, it goes really well. And we do pack for them to last three, four days or more in the mail. So we, even though it's next day delivery, we pack them so that if there was a delay, that they'll still be fine. So that's kind of how we do it. <clears throat> Scary Terry. Have you seen any Glossolepis multisquamata floating around with any of... Cut you off there, Scary Terry. Let's see if Scary Terry finished this, the thought. With any of your distributors. Yeah, I generally always carry uh, Multi um, as well as Juan Amensis. Um, I have some Gedoman Village coming in. I have some more. I'm sold out right now, but they should arrive, uh, well, hopefully next week when the new import comes. So we should get Juan Amensis. We should get Multi We should get Gedoman River. We should get um, one that I've been trying to get for quite a while. I'm doing it again. I'm breaking my rule. But here we go. 
since you asked, um, it's it's a is it a multi is it a glossolepis or oh sorry it's a chilotherina chilotherina price ci is what i've been trying to get in for quite a while um on glossolepis we're doing pseudo incisus as well as godoman village multi squamata and uh wanamensis is what should arrive hopefully next week on the glossolepis front rachel swit what would be a good Nigerian biotope, loosely speaking, schooling fish to complement a pair of cribs? I think that the red eye tetra would be fine. I think the blue dot here, let me let me actually show you. Um, so let's go here to get gills. Um, I'm gonna take you to my store and show you some stuff. That just came in that I think will do well. Well, Congo tetras, right? That's a no-brainer. Um, but schooling fish, I think these blue diamond tetras would do great. I think that the storm's eye would do good. They get I, on reading about them. It appears that they get bigger than I thought. Um, it looks like the storm's eye will get about two, two and a half inches or so. But that's still fine with cribs. And then, wait, what are the other ones? Oh, and then the, I don't know about the other ones I have because they're not identified. They're, they're mysteries. So I think those would be good. I think you'd be fine with Brycinus longipinus as well, although I don't have any of those I can offer you. But sometimes they're available from other suppliers. Uh, let me just show you that fish. Brycinus It's one of my favorites. Um, they look, yeah, there you go. That's a good picture of one. They're kind of like a golden color. You get this dark spot on the on the tail. Cool looking fish. So those are some that come to mind. There are some new, um, fairly new tetra species coming out of the Congo lately that are amazing that you could look into. Um, Forgetting the genus is it Phenogramus, maybe, um, but like the red Congo, well, like this. Here, let's do it again. Like if you type in red Congo tetra, there are fish like these that are starting to come in that are really cool. Um, all kinds of different stuff coming out now. It's they're not available very often, and. Here's a neat one, here's a neat one. These guys are neat, these guys are neat. They're not coming in very often. When they do, they're expensive. They can be 30 to 60 bucks a pop, depending on the species. So I don't know how much you want to spend, but that's something else to look into for a biotope. They're pretty cool. The blind fish keeper. I got my notification that fish are in the mail today. Awesome. Can't wait for my Denison barbs to arrive in the morning. Thanks for everything you do, Dan. Hey, you're welcome. And yeah, please let me know. Uh, if they look good when they arrive and anyone that gets fish from me um, this time of year it's very helpful if you can and no obligation but if you can um, just send me a note to let me know what the temperature was of the bags when they got to you it's the time of year when the weather's changing a lot and I do check the weather in every area before I send them but it, it helps when customers get feedback. So I got some feedback Monday and it was like, hey, these came in at 83 degrees and another one was like, they came in at 82 degrees. And so things have shifted from coming in in the mid to upper 70s. Now a lot of things are coming in in the low 80s. So that tells me I need to back off on heat packs a bit. And as the weather changes, it's just nice to get that feedback. So I, I have a better idea of what to do heat pack wise than I would by just going to weather.com and checking what the forecast says the, like the real actual temperature measurements are very helpful um, aquatic amigos what size is the tank behind you this is 125 gallon one of my favorite tanks is this size they're six feet long 18 inches front to back and about two inches from the bottom to the top um, just that six feet of swimming room allows you to put a lot of cool fish in there. 
it, it, you can do a lot with a tank like that. Iowa Interstate Railroad fan, what made you decide to use majority 75 gallon tanks? The majority of my tanks are actually 40 gallon breeders. Um, I have 75 40 gallon breeders in the annex upstairs. Down here in the basement, they're mostly 75 gallon tanks and um, you got like 45 of them down here, something like that. And the reason is, because in a 75 gallon tank, you can put lots of stuff. You can put a whole bunch of tiny little tetras, or you can put in a fair number of larger cichlids, um, larger, you know, six inch cichlids, nothing, <laughs> not larger, not a wolf cichlid or, or anything like that. But um, that's why I just thought, you know, with, a, with that four foot long footprint, when I go to, to order the fish and decide what I'm gonna import, I won't be constrained by like, you know, if you only have a 20 gallon tank, then that constrains a lot of what you can do. But with a 75 gallon tank, you have a large variety of fish you can put in there. So it was just to have the options open of what I could bring in. Um, and also when I first started down here, I wasn't planning on turning this into a business. It was, it was for a hobby. So I had 35 and a half gallon aquariums for spawning and uh, starting fry in. I had a rack of just like little plastic uh, shoebox containers to incubate eggs and start fry in the very early stages, move them to the five and a half gallon tanks, um, have some 20 gallons and a bunch of 30 gallons just for raising stuff up or, or moving pears into to spawn or condition. And then the 75 gallons were to raise large batches of fry. So when I first conceived of this room down here, it was to have... Um, Basically, it was to be able to raise lots of fry because breeding was my main focus. It's what I really love. But as things grew and developed and changed and importing became more of the operating standard that I use or method that I use, um, then I was really glad I had the 75 gallons. So when I expanded, I put in lots more 75 gallons because they worked really well. Now in the warehouse, it's going to be mostly 40 gallon breeders with quite a few 75 gallon tanks as well. So that's the plan for that. Okay. Michael Machos, I tried to get Primetime Aquatics to move their stream to another day. Sorry they are unable. You two are among my three favorites. Yeah, it's hard to, like I could, I've been doing it at this same time on this day for, is it three years now, maybe longer? So. I couldn't change it. It's, it's, it's established, right? So I get it. I'm sorry that you can't see primetime live, but you know, there's the replay and that's a great channel. You know, there's a lot of good information available there and their videos always look good. They, there's something about how their fish room is set up that is very different from mine. <laughs> like in mine, we've got like, you know, spray foam insulation up there and and over on the walls, all this yellow stuff here. And mine's very utilitarian. It's very much um, built for function, not for looks. What I like about prime times is uh, their stuff looks really good. The way I have that room set up, it plays really well on camera. Whereas mine, I'm like, well, the fish are pretty. <laughs> I don't know about everything else. <laughs> well, and me, of course, but besides me and the fish, not much else is pretty down here. And, and hey, what an honor to be in one of your top three favorites. Thank you so much. AI, or is it Al? I can't remember. Do Golden Rose Line and regular Rose Line get along in the same tank? Yeah, absolutely. And if so, how many would you recommend in a 120 community tank? Um, well, I don't know how many other fish you have in that community or what else is in the community, but 120 gallon. So for those that don't know, that's a four foot long tank. That's two feet front to back. Uh, it's, you know, a squat tank, man, you could get a lot in there. And if you want to keep them long term, once they get three, four inches, I think in a tank like that, that's about four feet long, I'd maybe go with about a dozen because that'll still give you room for other fish and it won't just be so full of them that there's no negative space left. Uh, I like tanks with some negative space because then the fish can actually explore and move around and not every inch is taken by fish. 
It's more interesting to me when there's enough negative space. So I start with a dozen and see how you feel after that. But I mean, how many could you get depending on how you maintain tanks and and uh, your filtration and water change schedule and all that. I mean, you could get a ton in there, but I think a dozen would be good. Fish guy, Mikey. It's a small patch. Okay, so we're talking about the rainbow fish that has some fungus. It's a small patch on his back because he scratched himself after I got him in the cloudy I just started. Been treating with Canaplex and have an okay temp as well as feeding high protein food. Okay. Um, yeah, if if the scratch isn't like getting infected or, or getting like the wound getting worse or anything like that, I honestly would just go with keeping really cl clean water in a stress-free environment and then seeing how they go from there. And if things do turn bad or you're like, hey, that wound's not getting better, it's actually growing or bad things are happening on it, right? Then then maybe move to a hospital tank and treat. But uh, that's my two cents. I'm no veterinarian, I'm not a doctor, a fish medicine or anything like that. But that's how I would, I think, approach that with the information I have if that was my fish. I mean, please be aware, though, I, neither am I a veterinarian, but even if I was, not even fish vets can really diagnose and prescribe unless they actually are in touch with the animal, right? It's really hard to do. Swamp Thing, Sheridan looks spectacular. It is. How many months of the year would a Swamp Thing from Florida be happy there? <laughs> like none. It could snow any month here, honestly. There, it, it snowed in June a few years ago. I mean, just a one single like storm, right? And didn't last or anything. But um, when I would bring people in from for the theater festival, I'd be like, "Hey, like bring clothes for anything." <laughs> like <laughs> it's it's mountain weather. So in the summer, though, it's pretty awesome because we don't get too hot. So I would say from June through mid October. It's pretty darn nice around here. I, that's when I really like it because you know, no one in town has an air conditioner. It's just nice and cool all summer long. So that's what I like about it. Jackson Tax. Hello, big warm mental hugs. Sorry, tired, so lurking. I'm actually pretty tired too. Maybe I'll just lurk for the rest of the stream. <laughs> I feel you, Jackson Tax. Like, it's been like, it's been a lot of early mornings and late nights and just a lot of hard work, so I'm, I'm pretty tired, but I get you. I get the urge to lurk. Fish Guy Mikey, it's Mikey. Oh, Mikey. Not Mikey, sorry. Fish Guy Mikey. Not trying to be rude, just people get confused with my name. Sorry about that. Oh, no worries. I'm glad you corrected me. I will try to remember that, but I'm not trying to be rude either, but I'll probably forget eventually. But for now, Mikey. Scary Terry, already got that one, already got Nathaniel. So this, I should bring this up. So folks, if you list a question or comment, um, it doesn't really help to list it again and again and again. I mean, I just go down and I get them as they come. So unless you know that I've like passed it and, and accidentally didn't see it or chat jumped so I didn't see it or whatever and now I'm below where your comment was left then go ahead and left it, leave it again but it's a lot of hard work for the mods when you just post a comment again and again and again so let's just do it once unless I pass you then do it again um, fish guy Miki see I got it also sorry about saying the question two times it copied on accident oh no worries now that I said that <laughs> Dennis Christensen what is a good loach for 30 gallon nano tank. Oh, like rosy loaches would be awesome. You'll see them. They're out and about. They're not as hidey as a lot of roaches, roaches, loaches. So rosy loaches are their, their close cousins that are kind of the same, but different color patterns. Those would be awesome. A big school of those would be great. Um, I think that would be my number one recommendation to look into those. There's another loach that's really closely related that I think is called a banded loach just different colors but kind of acts and looks the same as far as body type and finage and things goes globe gaming well 
Coolie loaches would be good too. You just won't see them as much, but they're awesome. And if you get a big group, you'll see some really cool behavior in coolie loaches too. Globe Gaming, any tips? Oh, I already got the green phantom pleco question. Sorry, I couldn't help with that. Michael Melier, beat Cory Doris for warm at dance fish. Beat Cory Doris for warm angelfish tank. I think you're asking what corridor is to put in a warm angel fish tank. The one that automatically pops to my mind is corridor is stare by. Um, a lot of corys prefer cooler temperatures, especially ones that come from really rapid flowing uh, water or down in southern Brazil, northern Argentina, that area. But stir by, I think, will do just fine. That's one that people keep with discus all the time. So I'd go stir by. I'm sure there's others. But that's the one that pops to mind. And speaking of popping to mind, seeing Michael there reminds me that I want to tell you guys about our newsletter. Um, let me find it here so I can show it to you. All right. So we started a newsletter. The first one was released um, May 1st. We're going to do it on the first of every month. And Michael helped with that. He helped us write the article that is in it. So let me just show you what it is so you can decide if it's something you might be interested in or not. So here's the newsletter. Um, hey, we have a newsletter. We're going to start having a bit, uh, keeping people up to date on the warehouse build as that goes. And then there's an article. There's a full-length article here, Magazine Worthy, that Michael Melier worked really hard on. Um, about the orange Venezuelan corridors. So we're trying to add value. We're, we're not trying to just be like, hey, buy my stuff. Here's what we have for sale. Um, so there's a nice article there. Then we talk about the live streaming podcast in, in case folks don't know about that. Um, show one of the videos that we liked that we did in the last month or so. And then we talk about the, the new order that arrived from Nigeria, the new import. So that's what we did in May and we'll do something similar in June, um, where it's kind of updates about what's going on with the company, like the warehouse and all that stuff. But we'll always have some kind of article in there, or something that's good information, good reading. So it isn't just it isn't just like a list of here's the fish we have for sale this this month, right? So if you if you would like to get the newsletter and you you didn't get it in May, that means you're not signed up then if you'd send me an email, dan at dancefish.com, and I'll add you to the email list for the newsletter. We don't have it yet, but Jonathan's going to put something on the website where you could sign up there, and it's a lot easier. But in the meantime, dan at dancefish.com, just send me an email, and I'll get you added. Scary Terry. Oh, I already got that one. Dennis Christensen, what is a good lotion to eat? The pond snails in the 30-gallon tank. Ah, pretty much any of them. Um, Cooley loaches will do it. I think rosy loaches will do it, although I could be wrong about that. The really small botead loaches will do it for sure. Like, um, what's, the, what's the really small um, chain loach uh, Suda uh, it's got a really long scientific name I gotta look it up here um, yes. ah there it is this one I, I can never say the name but it's this Suda Moonkey <laughs> the dwarf chain loach um, they'll eat snails for sure. They're cool. They're not cheap. They're one of the more expensive of the botiads, but um, they don't get too big, so that's good for a 30-gallon nano tank. And they'll eat they'll eat snails for sure. So that's the one I think I would go with. You could get some of the others, like the um, zebra loach and some of the others, but they're gonna get four inches or so. Those little dwarf chain loaches only get about two inches. So that would be probably my first pick for snail control. Um, if you don't like coolie loaches. One dirty platy. Hope Brian knows how to walk in heels. Well, he better. Friday's coming. <laughs> Who's Brian and why does he want to walk in heels? That probably made, I'm sure that made sense back when the comment was left, but I'm so far behind. I, the joke's going over my head. Sorry. <laughs> All 
All right, I'm scrolling because chat jumped. Try not to miss anyone, so pardon me for one moment as I scroll, scroll, scroll here to the back. Okay, it, it jumped big time. So the first one I can see is Globe Gaming, who says, just picked up some zebra snails. Are those the ones that breed crazy? Either way, they are awesome. So if you left a comment before Globe Gaming left that comment and I haven't got to it, then feel free to post it again because chat jumped and cut me off. But um, I don't know what you mean by zebra snails. If you mean zebra nerite snails, um, which I assume you are talking about, zebra nerite snails will not reproduce like crazy in your aquarium. They'll lay eggs. But the and the eggs will hatch, but the larvae won't develop because they need seawater to develop. So, what happens in in nature is the the larvae hatch and go to the top of the water column and float up there, and they get washed out to the ocean where they develop, and then they come back later. Is my understanding. I'm not an expert in nerite snails, but I, I believe that's the case. But um, because of that life cycle, if you have a freshwater aquarium, they'll breed in there like crazy. You'll get lots of eggs, but they're not gonna. They're not gonna actually successfully reproduce. Did somebody just throw money at me? I think someone did. Kelly Foreman throwing down nine ninety nine. I'm pretty excited getting uh, for the new warehouse. Oh, me too. Will you increase your number of imports? Yes, that's one reason we're doing this. Um, we absolutely cannot keep up with uh, the demand that we have right now. And there's a lot of people that miss out on species because we have limited space. And a lot of people that request species and we just can't bring in everything people want because we have limited space. And so right now we do an import on average, we do six imports a year, six to eight, I guess, a year. But on average, it's like there's one month we don't do one and then the next one we do and then the next month we don't and then the next month we do, right? Every other month. Um, with the warehouse, we expect to do imports pretty much weekly because we'll have a lot more tank space and can do that. And what's going to be really nice about it is right now, because we have limited space, um, we have to sell over 50% of our stock before we've cleared enough room to bring in another import. In the new warehouse, it's going to be closer to like 12%. So right now it's like we sell a ton and then we kind of run out of stuff. We have to do the new import. So sales drop while we're waiting for it. Then the new import comes and we sell a ton. And then so it's like one month, tons of sales. Next month, very light sales because we don't have an import yet. We're still clearing enough room and getting it arranged, right? Then the next month, lots of sales. And the next month, low sales. We, it's this roller coaster. It's this bi-monthly roller coaster that follows the import cycle. So by having the warehouse, we'll cut that. We'll, all those peaks and valleys will be mitigated and it'll be more like this than like this, which will be a lot better for managing the business. <laughs> all right. Did chat jump again? Nope. Okay, cool. Wild Discus and other fish. Hi, Dan. Have you ever imported or sold Melanotania Kalitawa rainbow fish? I wish. That is one that is super hard to find. Um, I'm just going to Google it real quick so people can see how awesome this fish is. This is one everybody wants. But no, there's there's no uh, there's no one breeding them in enough quantity to supply them regular regularly yet. So hopefully we can get some in sometime. But at the moment we can't. They're these guys with these awesome red tails, this neat dark pattern on the body. Really cool looking fish. I, I like them a lot, and I wish I could. Everybody wants them because they're so beautiful. But there's no steady supply right now. Mega Mindy Lou, is it common to mix up Angelicus, Botia, and Yo-Yo Loach? Huh. I bought both, paid the high price for the Angelicus and $8 for the Yo-Yo, but they look identical in my tank. So the I think it's more common to confuse the Histrionica with the Yo-Yo Loach. Um, but Angelicus is pretty different looking, at least... Well, I guess the question is, 
sometimes they're hard to tell when they're adults. So let's let's look at this. Um, Botia angelicus, the Burmese border loach. All right. So as an adult, you get these patterns, right? It, it becomes these adult patterns. In the yo-yo loach, as an adult, see if we can find a picture of an adult. Yeah. Uh, I need to modify the search to include adult because we're seeing a bunch. So, and then with the yo-yo loach, same thing. The pattern changes drastically when they're adults, right? And then let's look at the histrionica. Just to show this. Very similar, right? So this histrionica versus the angelicus, they're different, but there's a wide variety in the adult patterns. So I think that loaches can just be hard to identify in general. And I think that in the hobby, a lot of what happens is um, the vendor buys from their supplier and their supplier lists it as a yo-yo loach or as an angelicus loach or as a uh, golden zebra loach, which is what the histrionic is often called. And so the person buys from their supplier and they're like, oh, okay, I'm, I want the angelicus. They get sent loaches. They bought angelicus. So they just label them angelicus where it, that doesn't mean that in the supply chain until they got to them, there wasn't a mix up or a mislabel or someone was just like, oh, look like Angelicus to me, you know, and, and they moved down the chain like that. So I don't think it's intentional. I think there's just a lot of misidentification and mislabeling on a lot of fish in the industry. Um, and those fairly similar looking loaches, I think it happens all the time. But yeah, that's, it's pretty common with loaches for sure. And, but there's another danger too, though, of like looking at a yo-yo loach and being like, hey, that's not a yo-yo loach. I mean, they have a massive distribution. So one population might have the classic Y-O-Y-O -Y -O pattern, that, which is why they're called yo-yo loaches. But a population, uh, you know, across the mountain might look completely different. So it's also hard to identify fish just based on looks when they're similar looking fish, especially when they have a wide range and there's so many different populations because there's a lot of variance in those populations. Orange goes, do hatchet fish ever look chubby? Huh, mine from you are well-fed, live, uh, and no disease, but always see seem too skinny for me. Yeah, I, the reason I went, huh, is because no, they never look chubby. Hatchet fish uh, always look skinny. Most of what the hatchet fish is is a big keel bone that comes down to support the muscle group that supports their um, pectoral fins that they use to fly, fly in quotes, glide, when they jump out of the water to escape predators. So most of what the hatchet fish is is just a big, big keel bone to support a muscle structure. Um, they always look skinny, yeah. David Foster, my Congo spotted puffer is in a tank full of bladder snails, but I haven't seen him go for any yet. He comes up and begs for bloodworms instead. Should I hold off on feeding him for a bit? Um, well, you do want to make sure that the beak stays under control. I have always sold them so quickly that I've never, I've never had them long enough to know how long it takes for the beak to get out of control. I don't know that. Um, and I pretty quickly transition them to rapashi with oyster shell in it so that they're, they're picking at that once every day or every couple days. So I haven't had any problem with the beaks overgrowing, but I haven't had them long term. So I'm, what I'm trying to figure out is Here's what I would suggest. I would suggest mixing rapashi with some oyster shell and putting that in there um, 
every day for say two weeks. And it's going to take a little while, but eventually that puffer, that's why I say two weeks before you give up, but eventually that puffer will realize that's food and start eating it. And as they eat it, they'll be chewing on those oyster shells that are embedded in the rapashi, and that will help trim their teeth until they get interested in bladder snails or get big enough to tackle the bladder snails or whatever the issue there is. So how I would do that is before I fed the blood worms, I would put in the rapashi with oyster shell mixed in it. So there's a lot of grit in there to wear down their beak. And I'd leave it in there for, I don't know, say half an hour, an hour. Um, and I'd remove it before the rapashi starts to kind of you know, disintegrate into powder, which depending on how you prepare it, it can take a while before that happens. And then I would feed the bloodworms afterwards. And I just keep doing that until they realize that that rapashi was something to eat and started chewing on it. And at that point, I would rotate the two. I'd feed something like that in the morning maybe that had the oyster shell in it and then in the evening maybe feed them the blood work so that every day or maybe every other day whatever it is they're they're getting a chance to wear down their teeth that's how I would go about managing that Jenny Lynn says hello well hello right back Nathaniel Blakely, how do you do water changes? So um, I'd refer you to the channel. There's a, a video on the, the system I use. It's all automated. So basically I, I have the whole fish room plumbed so that every night there's automatic water changes that happen and every aquarium gets 30 to 40% water change every night is how I manage it. Now that's not necessary for, for how people usually keep fish, but I'll often, since I import and resell, I have to have a lot of fish in one tank and I want that water quality really pristine because when the fish come from import, they have some recovering to do often. And the best thing you can do to help fish recover is just give them nice, clear, clean water. They aren't fighting ammonia, they aren't fighting a bunch of, you know, decaying biological matter that's creating protozoan blooms and things like that so I change a lot of water so that's how I do it 30 to 40 percent a day and it just every night happens automatically it's all on timers and it's all automated now every now and then I'll go and siphon out some muck in the bottom because um, maybe I have plecos in that tank and they're creating a lot of waste or maybe I don't have a pleco in the tank so there's nothing cleaning stuff off the bottom and kicking it up so that it's taken out when the water changes or gets sucked into the um, box filter. So there are times when I'm like, hey, there's a little buildup in that tank in the corner there and I have to go and siphon it out. But in general, it's pretty much automated. Kind all night. My Cochina better with the swimming problem is better, cool, and very active. In the tank I put them in, there are many microorganisms that come from almond leaves that they like to graze on. That's awesome. I'm glad to hear that they recovered. I figured that was the case. Um, that was Betta Cochina, and it, it sometimes takes them a couple days to settle in after after shipping. So glad to hear it. Buddy Viper. Oh, and thanks for bringing that up because when I gave the shipping report, I totally forgot that there was a little concern with your Betta when it arrived. Yeah, I'm glad that he's settled in though and out and about now. Ken's Fish throwing down $4.99 with a thank you. Hey, you're welcome. Cheers right back at you. Now to Bunny Viper. Hi, I have been having a delightful time preparing for the arrival of my order on Tuesday. All six of my prize bumblebee gobies are thriving, eating a large variety of live foods. Great job. Awesome. Well, if you're spoiling them on a bunch of live foods all the time, they're going to love you, Bunny Viper. <laughs> That's their favorite. But I'm glad to hear they're doing well. And yeah, I can't. I'm excited for you to get your fish too. Pony Grill, hi Dan. Any nano fish or live bears in our future? I've gotten from you in the past are amazing. All I've gotten from you in the past are amazing. Thanks. Um, you know, I am going to add um, the boat. So there are a few fish that I got in the Nigerian shipment that I just haven't listed yet because they needed more time to recover. One was the Barboides gracilis, which is a great little nano fish. 
It's a small cyprinid or barb from Africa that I've been trying to get for a long time because they're, they're just hard to get. And mine came in looking kind of like, like this. They weren't emaciated, but they weren't like this. See that? That's a nice big fat full belly. That's what I want. Um, and so I've been taking a little extra time to get them from this to this. And they're starting to do it. Um, I think they're probably going to need another week and then I'll list them for sale. At that point, they aren't going to be completely fattened up at that point, but they'll have gained enough weight that I'm like, okay, they're eating, they're gaining weight, they'll do well from here on out. Um, they've got to the point where they're eating well on uh, carnivore pellets and algae wafers and things like that, and, and not just the baby brine shrimp. So at first it was just like everything I could do to get them to eat enough baby brine shrimp to keep weight on and gain weight. But now they're settled in, they're eating that really well. And for the last several days I've been feeding them um, sinking carnivore pellets and algae wafers. Just a few of them and they just kind of go down and graze at them for several hours. And that is one thing about them that I've noticed. They need a lot of dwell time with the food, kind of like a headstander or um, a benthic feeding goby, like a synodontist goby or something. They're not the kind of fish that you put in some food and they just go grab a bunch and they're, they're okay. They need to like just pick at stuff and slowly it takes them a while. So by feeding them algae wafers and larger pellets and stuff, um, they just kind of graze on them for several hours. And that seems to be doing the trick to transition them off of baby brine shrimp and keep food in front of them for like, you know, a long time so they're getting fatter. So those are one. Um, there's, let's see here, what are some others? If you can get your hands, oh, so that's one that I do have in that I'm about to release. I, I have several nano fish in stock right now and some of, this is, here's one that I think is awesome. Um, I just totally blinked on the genus. <laughs> Blue eyes, what's the genus? <laughs> oh, jeez. <laughs> I can't believe I missed it. Hey, this never happens. I know this genus like the back of my hand. Okay, I'm gonna have to do like fricata. <laughs> oh, this is embarrassing. Pseudomugil, jeez. How did I forget that? <laughs> okay. There are two pseudomugils I have in right now that I think are amazing. Um, they're hard to find, uh, they're almost never available, and they're these two. So these are great little nano fish. They stay up at the top, uh, top third of the aquarium, and they feed off the surface mostly. They don't go down very much. So these are two little, if you, if you like rare little nano fish, these are two species. They're expensive for sure, but they're, they're pretty cool. Um, but yeah, in general, I, I, I have lots of nano fish in. Um, so I'll keep bringing them in. Live bears, not so much. The live bears, I probably won't bring in many more until I get the warehouse, because in the warehouse, we're gonna have some hard water or harder water. So they'll do better. But um, I'm trying to think, I'm getting more Pseudomugil um, Luminatus in in the next order. Oh, there's these killifish are awesome. The neon green killifish, these guys, these are a great little nano fish. And I, I know the picture doesn't look like much, and in the videos, they don't look like much because this bright green iridescence that you're getting a hint of here just doesn't show up well on film in, in pics or videos. But, um, they have this amazing neon green iridescence that as they swim through, depending on how the light's hitting them, shimmers across their body. They're a pretty cool nano fish. Um, but yeah, I'll, I'll get more in of different nano fish. I, I tend to, that's kind of my preference is to get small, peaceful community fish. So, Well, that was a long roundabout way to answer Pony Girl's question. I guess I could have just answered yes. <laughs> and I'm glad to hear the ones that you've gotten are doing well. Lunatic Fringe, what are the other reasons besides low numbers of fry? Okay. 
So the fish like killifish are not in the aquarium shop industry. The ones that are are very common. I think that's the main reason, honestly. Um, like you put a pair of bettas together, you'll get a few hundred fry out of that spawn, right? And so you put five pairs of betta t bettas together, and you could have a thousand fry within one day. You know, just as they well, not within a day, but in a single day's spawning, they could produce that many eggs. So that's that's if you're farming something you want that you want to be able to create a lot of babies at one time because then you can grow them all together and it just makes the whole process easier the same with most of the common fish tetras um barbs all all the fish that are the bread and butter are generally bread and butter because they're super easy to spawn in large quantities at pretty much the same time so you can take the whole batch out to a pond if you're a farmer and raise them all together right killifish are not like that um, they are continuous spawners they lay a few eggs a day and that that puts a real wrench in the gears when you're trying to do a farming operation so they're not a fish that that you can go out and generally collect it easily in large numbers so there aren't a lot of them imported and they don't breed in large numbers so there are not a lot are not a lot of them bred it's the same reason that a lot of the wild type bettas are not readily available in pet stores and things right it's just that challenge of of production so that's the challenge yeah i think that is the reason brandon lee how many angels would you say would comfortably fit in a 55 gallon well, the main issue you're going to run into with angelfish is, is aggression. So I would either do one or a lot. If you do one, you're probably going to be fine. <laughs> Although sometimes they can turn into jerks and harass the tank, but in general, one's okay. If you have two, you could have a problem if you have two males that are constantly going to be picking on each other one will dominate the other one until it gets so stressed that it gradually wastes away is generally what happens if you get two and you have a boy and girl then they're going to want to spawn and they're going to be aggressive to the other fish in the tank if you get a lot of them though then you generally have a lot less problems the aggression spread out no one can claim things so much that they run the tank all the time. The worst that generally happens if you have a large group is a pair will go off and spawn and defend their corner of the tank. And then once the spawning's done and stuff, then things kind of go back to normal. Um, so how I would do that is in a 55 gallon, if you want it to be an angelfish tank, again, this depends on your filtration, your maintenance, your feeding schedule and, and all of that. but. In a 55 gallon, I personally would probably do, say, eight of them or so. I think that would spread the aggression nicely and give you the best chance of success, a, a group of around that size, without crowding the tank too much. So that's my take on it. Roundhouse Aquatics can't find good solid info. Um, I assume black belly limia carries the same as humpback, correct? I don't know, Roundhouse. I've never kept the black belly limia, um, so I, I have no idea. Black. Let me make sure I haven't kept it. Sometimes they call it, oh, Melanogaster. So, limia Melanogaster. So, let's see this one. It looks like these guys. Well, that's really cool. I do not know. Um, the Niger Fasciata come from a very specific lake on the island, and I think that's the only place they come from. So they, that lake might be a lot warmer than the habitat that the black belly limia comes from. I, I don't know. Maybe the black belly limia comes from different streams and stuff and has a variety of temperatures and environments and population is important on care. I don't know that much about it. So if anyone here knows about the black belly limia, could they 
uh, chime in and help Roundhouse out, because I honestly don't know. Fade wood. Speaking of cores and cooler water, I've got 12 green lasers in about 78 degrees. Would they do better in 68 to 74 degrees? I don't, I don't think green lasers are going to do poorly in 78 degrees. I've seen them kept long term at that temperature without any problem, but um, I don't think it would hurt either. If you want to take it to 75 degrees, then you're like right in the middle and that's probably pretty darn good for them. But I don't think sub 78 degrees is a problem for them. Now that being said, I haven't kept that fish long term personally. I'm just talking about people I know that have kept them and in the summer their fish room gets pretty warm and they've, they've done fine. So off the top of my head I can't think that that would be a problem. Um, but I'm going to have to do a, a call out again to the community if anyone here has kept green lasers long term themselves. Would you chime in on what you notice? I, I would say that if you want to breed them, you probably want to do a water change and bring that down to 75, 74 degrees. That would probably be helpful. But I haven't kept them long term myself. Uh, Fish Guy Miki, I asked because I'm so confused with these two that they have fungus and cloudy eye, but in the morning they go crazy and try breeding, so I was wondering whether they seem okay or not. Yeah, I mean, fish are very asymptomatic. If you act sick in the wild, you get eaten by predators like that. Um, so fish, even when they're sick, they don't act sick. Like, fish will fool you. They'll be so sick that they can't eat, but they'll still go nibble the food as if they're healthy, right? And then if you watch them carefully, you'll see like a minute later that they go over and spit it out somewhere. So it's like, this is a fish that is so ill it can't even eat, and it's hiding that. <laughs> so it's hard to tell by behavior, but what I would say is generally on rainbow fish is if it's not a serious thing, if it's like a light thing, um, clean water and keep an eye on it, and low stress is what I would recommend. Fish tank barn throwing down four ninety nine. Limia monogaster care is pretty much the same. Cool. Here's your answer from a guy that knows. As Niagara Fasciata in my experience. All right. You, you, you hear it from Mike. So there you go. Lunatic French Corridoris adolfoi is another species of Corridoris that likes warmer water. Okay. That's good to know. It's native to the Rio Negro. Cool. Hang on real quick. Let's check something. There's Duplicaris, which is so similar. Let's see here. Yeah, okay, okay, yeah. Yeah, I think you're right about that, Chewy. Um, I get Duplicaris and Adolfoy confused. Am I saying that right, Duplicaris? Um, confused sometimes, so I just wanted to double check. <laughs> um, I actually think the Dolphoy, check that out uh, on, on Planet Catfish. If I'm remembering right, I thought that the Dolphoy liked it cooler. Because I brought some in and I researched them pretty carefully before I did to make sure that I could take care of them right. If I remember right, I, I think they actually like it a little cooler. According to like seriously fish and planet catfish not I mean they're at the end all be all but that's usually where I go just for some information All right, it's 829. We got to shut this down. I'm sorry guys um, But we're gonna do the giveaway if you Well, it's too, I was gonna say if you want to enter but it's too late. We're already here. We're gonna roll it Let's see who won some Cardinal Tetras Castro Ophi Castro Ophi or Ofe probably you have won some Cardinal Tetras. We're gonna give you a uh, Oh, let's go two minutes to chime in. Um, Bunny Viper emailed me and was like, hey, I commented the moment you drew and it didn't show up. So we can get a little more time here for Castro Ofe. And I'm going to scroll down here so that I can see when Castro chimes in. While we're waiting on Castro, I'm going to go ahead and hey, got a super jet. Tone Tony, $4.99, keep it up. Oh, we will, we will, thanks. 
Mitchell Broom, I run most of my quarries 70 to 74, including your Adolphite breeding colonies. Yeah, if I remember right, I thought Adolphite preferred low 70s. Um, I'm keeping mine kind of down in the mid 70s because of that, because of what I read about them, and they seem to be doing well. Let's see here. Just waiting for Castro. Come on in, Castro. Kyle's Aquarium Metrics. Candy Overholes, could you... Could a sale of your stock to Dance Fish be in order? <laughs> Candy, I guess you own stock in Dance Fish. <laughs> Mitchell Broom. Over time, I ended up losing quite a few green lasers at the supposed upper end of their temps. Okay, this is good. They are much more stable, 74-ish, and I trigger them with water change down to 65 or so. Okay, there you heard it. So Mitchell is saying that in their experience, the green laser quarries do better at lower temperatures than the 78. So thanks for chiming in, Mitchell, because like I said, I've, I haven't kept that species long term. All right, Castro, you got a few more seconds, then we're going to draw again. Fishaholic moving seven goldfish from a 40 to a 70 gallon Home Depot black tote. Any tips cleaning moving wise for instant cycle? Moving, moving all two sponge fil sponges and a penguin filter. Not any, adding any not adding any fish currently. No substrate. Okay, Castro has chimed in that they're here. All right, Castro, if you would email me, dan at dancefish.com, your first and last name and your mailing address, then I'll give those cardinal tetras to you. And Fishaholic, um, the, I mean, the best way to instantly cycle a tank is to move some gravel and some filters and things from a currently cycled tank well-established tank to the new tank or new container or tote or whatever and just take them out and put them in there and get them running and add some fish right away so that the whole thing's stable again now it won't be seasoned for a while so you want to take it kind of slow but you you can do that yeah that's generally not a problem um, I wouldn't call the tank like really established though or the tote or whatever for a few months after you do that but you can definitely do that I do it all the time I just, if you've got a bubbling sponge filter, you've got two of them, it said, move one over, get it bubbling in the new tote, put in some fish, just don't feed heavily for the first couple of weeks, keep it kind of light, that's, that's what I would say. Oh, you're not adding any fish? I wouldn't do it until you add fish then, because if you're not, if you're not putting food in there and the fish aren't creating waste, there's going to be nothing to generate the ammonia that the nitrifying bacteria need to survive and your beneficial bacteria population will basically shrink because there's no food. So I wouldn't do that until you have fish unless you want to put a bunch of black worms in there or shrimp or something to keep the cycle going until you get fish. All right, we're out of time, folks. Thanks for being here. Thanks to my mods. I appreciate you being here every week. Thanks to everyone that threw, threw money at us. Thanks for the super chats. Greatly appreciate it. Thanks everyone that left questions and comments. For those that I couldn't get to your question and comment today, um, I'm sorry. I'll try to get you next time. Hope you have a good one. Wait, is Punchy Paints going to go next? I don't know if Punchy Paints is going to go next or not, but it's worth checking out Punchy Paints' YouTube channel. If she is, it'll be there. <laughs> anyway, have a good one, folks. We'll be back next week, same bat time, same bat channel. Oh, I forgot the Lurker Nation. And I forgot everyone watching on the replay. Thanks you as well. Anyway, until next week, I hope you have a good one. Bye-bye. Oh, how long have I been on the wrong screen? Oh, man. Probably for hours. <laughs> anyway, bye-bye, folks. <laughs> Jeez. <sighs>